because there was so many men and women of God, black, white, Latino, who felt the same thing. And so I feel like I'm standing in good, uh, good company, you know, and if all of them, including me, you know, our word ends up being wrong. Oh my gosh. Crack your Bible over to 1 Kings chapter 22. Hey fam, it's Rachel. Today on Crack Your Bible, I wanted to talk to you all about banishing a spirit of fear. Now last week I did assign homework for everybody so that y'all could be up to speed when we talk about banishing a spirit of fear. I assigned everybody to read Deuteronomy 18, Jeremiah 14, and Jeremiah 23. So read through all three of those chapters so y'all can be up to speed instead of being like, oh, well, what about this? Just read the whole chapters first. So this is why we crack our Bible, because if you don't know his word, you won't know his voice, and then you're going to be very confused. And Satan capitalizes on that confusion. You know, God is not a God of confusion. This is why we crack our Bible so that we can know what he has to say. Because as King Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And there's always going to be trying times. There's always going to be disasters in various places and wars and rumors of wars and financial crises. That stuff's always going to happen because Satan is the God of this world and we live in a fallen world. But we know that God is in control. Even though Satan is the God of this world, we know that when Jesus returns, that the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So we don't have to worry about that. But if you aren't reading his word, if you aren't spending time in prayer with Jesus, your eyes aren't on Jesus. So then all of the sudden, when all of the trials of this life begin to happen all around you, all of a sudden, a spirit of fear creeps in and Christians, they take their eyes off Jesus and they start freaking out about all of the things that are going on in Satan's domain. Now, as Christians, we have been adopted into God's family and he has given us his name. He's given us his shem. He's given us authority. And he sent us out with a job to do. So he didn't just like throw us to the wolves. No, he gave us a title. He gave us a position where his children and he gave us authority to act in his name. And he gave us a job to do, which is to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel. But as ambassadors for Christ in a foreign land, in a hostile kingdom, we have to be suited up every day with the full armor of God, according to Ephesians. This is why we put on the full armor of God every single day. But we don't just put on the armor. We have to wield the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Because every single day when you're doing what God wants you to do, Satan is going to try to blow you off course. He's going to try to take you out of the battle against him by throwing these fiery darts of the devil at you. And that's why you have to have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. And you gotta have the sword of the spirit so you can take those fiery darts down so that you can march in, move forward, advance on his territory so we can bind the strong man and plunder his house of souls. We want to see the captives set free. Jesus made it possible when he conquered the cross. And now it's our turn through the power of the Holy Spirit to go in, march, and share the gospel with people so that after this message of the kingdom will be preached throughout the entire world and then the end will come. So we have to do our job if we want Jesus to return because he's not coming back until the whole world hears the message of the gospel. And this is why he's placed you and the time, the place, the situation that you're in so that you can reach the people that are best suited to be reached specifically by you who wouldn't listen. They won't listen to me. They won't listen to these people over there. They'll listen to you. And this is why God has placed you in this specific 
place that you're in right now to do his will. But Satan wants you to forget this. And so he has controlled opposition. He has people that come in like ferocious wolves, like outwardly they look like lambs, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves ready to take down those within the body of Christ. Jesus already warned us about this ahead of time. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. These controlled opposition, these false prophets work for Satan, but they have a form of godliness, but they deny his power. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are here to exploit you in their greed. They are here to tell you whatever you want to hear so that they are edified. They're not here to build up Jesus's kingdom. They're here to build up their own kingdom and they're doing it through the help of Satan. And this is why we need to get to the root cause of the spirit of fear. What is ushering in the spirit of fear? Because, you know, when we've talked about occult objects and getting rid of occult objects in your household, we've already discussed legal rights where uh, entities have legal right into your home. If you've invited them in, if you have uh, talismans and occult objects, or you dream catcher, you know, whatever, statuary um, of these occult items. So you got to get rid of this kind of stuff. So if you've already done that and you've repented of, you know, whatever sins that you've been involved in, what is ushering in this spirit of fear that is seizing so many people within the body of Christ? People are literally about to pass out because they are so just filled with a spirit of fear, whether it's masks, whether it's the stuff going on uh, with the economy, whether it's the news, whether it's the election, all of these things that are going on, climate change, you know, whatever. Oh, the protests, oh, the riots, oh, blah, 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 whatever. People are just losing it. And it's like, hold on, what is ushering in this spirit of fear? Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. So why are people so afraid of everything instead of just like using common sense guidelines and just being like, hey, you know, pandemics happen. I'm going to take precautions. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to be a good representative for Jesus. And I'm going to keep on trucking so that I can continue in my mission to tear down demonic strongholds so I can go and through the power of the Holy Spirit, bring these captives out of Satan's grasp. Like what is ushering this in? And I realized after listening to uh, so many different pastors when I was doing my video about false teachers, and I'm going to link that right up here and how they like worship politicians and they're promoting this stuff in their church. Um, I listened to quite a lot of just absolute insanity for that video. And I know that um, a lot of other people listen to these people because the church has just like lost their mind. Like they're following and regurgitating all of the lies that these people are saying, but they don't realize that these people are controlled opposition. And these are the ones who are ushering in that spirit of fear because the more that you're afraid, the more that you're turning to them for answers instead of turning to Jesus, instead of turning to the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, according to John 1.1. 1, 1. These false teachers, they have a reason to mislead you because they want to usher in that spirit of fear because the more you're fearful, the more you're going to turn your ear towards them. Oh, what should we do? What's going to happen? What? And then all of a sudden they begin to say things like, well, God told me this and God prophesied that. And then all of a sudden people are just like hanging on their every word because these people, oh, they had a word from God. So let me hear. I don't hear from God, but this person says that they hear from God. So therefore, like, let me listen to what they have to say. And it's just like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> like, first of all, if you have somebody that has constantly put you in a state of fear, 
y'all need to check that person real quick and be like, hold on, is this from the Holy Spirit or is something else going on? Satan has been sending false teachers into the church controlled opposition since the jump. And this is why it's imperative for Christians to crack their Bible because you won't be able to discern who is with God or against God? Because there's many people that they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from God. You know, Satan knows the Bible better than anyone. So you think that the people that he sends into churches won't also know scripture too? This is why it is imperative that we know Bible prophecy. Because the only reason that we're here is because of the hope that we have that the things that were prophesied are going to come true, where Jesus Christ is going to come back for us and we are going to be harpazo, caught up in the air with him to meet him in the air and then in a twinkling of the eye be changed instantly. So we're all here today because we are trusting in the validity and 100% accuracy of Bible prophecy. This is why God's standard for Bible prophecy is a 100% success rate. He has a zero tolerance policy for even one wrong prophecy. Details matter. Details absolutely matter because this is how we discern whether or not somebody is a true mess is the true Messiah, Jesus Christ or a false Messiah. Jesus already promised us that there would be wolves that would come into the church. He also told us that in the last days that there would be lying signs and wonders that would deceive, if possible, even the elect, and that there would be false messiahs that rise up. So if they tell you, oh, he's in the desert, oh, he's in the inner room, don't go. But how do you know that somebody is a false messiah? How do you know if the signs are lying signs and wonders? You compare it to the word of God. And this is why God's standard demands 100% accuracy because God gives us specific details. He doesn't just give vague general prophecies. He gives us times, places, things that people wear, people's exact names. He gives us uh, whole timelines. So if any one of those um, details is not in line with prophecy. It's not the prophecy. And then, you know, just reject it. This is how you figure out, are these people who they say they are? Are these the ones that were prophesied? This is why people search the scriptures to see if Jesus was who he said he was in the scripture when he walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. Is this the one who was prophesied about? This is why it's imperative that since Jesus went back into heaven that we know Bible prophecy so that we can see, hey, are the things that are coming true, is this the stuff spoken in the Bible or are these just things that happen because we live in a fallen world? We have to discern these things. Otherwise, false teachers, controlled opposition will always be able to take advantage of your ignorance and usher in a spirit of fear so that your eyes aren't on Jesus, your eyes are on everything else that's going on in the world, and people aren't getting saved. This is why it's not up to us to change the standard. Our, our standard doesn't matter. The only standard that matters is God's standard, and he demands 100% accuracy. We see this over in Revelation chapter 11. If you want to crack your Bible over to Revelation 11. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. So what has to happen? There has to, number one, be an outer court. There has to be Gentiles who are trampling on the holy city for 42 months. So if any of those five things don't take place, not 41 months, not 43 months, 42 months, in the holy city, Jerusalem, it has to be the Gentiles doing it. There has to be an outer court. Like if these things don't come to pass, then it's not the prophecy of Revelation 11 2, And you can just push it aside. Moving on to the very next verse, Revelation 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Two witnesses clothed in sackcloth, 1,260 days. These aren't figures of speech. Oh, oh, the Jews and the Christian are the two. No, it's 
two witnesses and they are physically wearing sackcloth and they're going around for 1,260 days. So if these things don't come to pass in that exact way, not 1,000 days, not 2,000 days, 1,260 days, if it does not happen that way, it's not the two witnesses of Revelation 11.3. God gives specifics. God gives details so that you can verify if the things that are happening are true. He does not give these vague prophecies like you see some of these false teachers out here. Oh, triumph, but we're going to misspell it and it's going to kind of sound the same like Hank Kuhneman. Pay attention. Why do you think God allowed a man to be raised up with the name Trump? Which the Lord said something, said, I'm standing in the midst of the man and my spirit is attached to him and I'm putting Trump and I'm calling it triumph with I'm standing in the middle. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Oh my gosh. Like people realize God deals in specifics. Crack your Bible over to Revelation 13, five really quick. The beast was giving a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. If whatever doesn't have a mouth to speak and exercise authority for 42 months, not 40 months, not 10 years, not two, you know, eight years, 42 months, then it's not the beast of Revelation 13, 5. Specifics, specifics in Bible prophecy are how we verify that the things that are going on are of scripture or they're just the things that are going on in this world. This is imperative. This is why we're all here today. We are trusting on the 100% accuracy and the validity of the visions of Daniel, of the visions of John the Revelator, of the prophecies of Jesus, of all of the signs and the symbols that we saw in all of the biblical holidays that pointed to Jesus. We're all looking forward to Meeting Jesus up in the air based off of the prophecies in this book. This is why God demands 100% accuracy. And if you did the homework last week for Deuteronomy 18, what is the penalty for one wrong prophecy? Crack your Bible over to Deuteronomy 18, starting at verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is the message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Why are you not afraid? Because over in verse 20, it says, but if a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything that I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the names of other gods, he must be put to death. Now, we don't live in ancient Israel. We don't have the legal right to enact God's justice here on this earth today in modern times. Therefore, what are we going to do? We're going to cut these people, these false prophets, out of our lives. There is no grace for false prophecy because there are consequences to false prophecy. We can see that God doesn't play with false prophets, but also guess what? There are going to be consequences for people who listen to the words of the false prophets because they're going to be so focused on hearing a good positive word and it speaks to me and it says the things that I hope will happen that they're not prepared for the calamity that God is going to bring down on those he wants to bring calamity down on. God uses wars and famines and pestilence and, uh, you know, invaders, all sorts of things to bring about teshuva, repentance and justice and righteousness. God is a holy God and he demands holiness and God is going to bring about his will any way that he wants to do it. 
regardless of whether or not you find it scary or distasteful or difficult, he's going to do these things. This is why we have to have our ear turned towards the Holy Spirit and the true word of the Lord instead of just listening to people who tell you what your itching ears want to hear because there are consequences to false prophecy. And if you did the homework, you guys would have read through Jeremiah 14. So let's start at Jeremiah 14, starting at verse 10. This is what the Lord says about this people. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Then the Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. But I said, ah, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you a lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by the sword and famine. And the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and sword. There will be no one to bury them or their wives, their sons and their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. God does not deal with false prophets. And he's not going to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go easy on you because, you know, you were misled by a false prophet. No, you should have known because he's already given you his word. You already have direct access to Jesus Christ. He's already sent the helper, the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you in all things. But you have to listen to them. You can't harden your heart. You can't have a seared conscience where it's like, nope, I'm not going to listen to anything that does not line up with my will. You have to be listening to the Holy Spirit and what is God saying? And when I hear something, does it line up with scripture? Because if we or an angel from heaven teaches another gospel, let them be accursed. There are no private revelation. There is no changing of the scripture this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to go. So if it doesn't line up with this, it's not what's being talked about in this book. So crack your Bible over to Jeremiah chapter 23 really quick. Start at verse 9. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord. And his holy words, the land is full of adulterers because of the curse, the land lies parched and the pastures in the desert are weathered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. This is serious. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. So people who call themselves God's people, who claim to be part of the ecclesia, claiming to be part of the body of Christ, seeing these people in the house of the Lord, you find godless people in their wickedness. And this is what God sees. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness and there they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year that they are punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among them, the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hand of hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. 
I will make them eat bitter food and drink poison water because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. He is referencing um, the penalty for adultery is eating the bitter food and drinking the poison water. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst forth in a wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot find him? declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord. I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. God doesn't play with false prophets. God does not deal with false teachers. He does not entertain that. He has no grace for any of these people. They will be punished and thrown out into everlasting darkness. Game over because they're leading people astray. Christians, we cannot continue to entertain any of this sort of behavior. Not only are false teachers getting a foothold and just multiplying in the church because Christians are trying to subvert God's standard and impose their own standard where it's like, we're just going to have so much grace for false teachers and false prophets. And, you know, oh, you know, things happen. You just, you know, you gotta, you gotta realize that not everybody can be a hundred percent all the time. No, God is a hundred percent all of the time. So it's not just Christians trying to impose this like hyper grace for false prophets working for Satan. There's another thing at play here that is allowing false teachers to creep into the church and just inundate the whole place with various spirits, lying spirits, spirits of false religion, a spirit of fear. And that is, crack your Bible over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 3 for the answer. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. People will have itching ears and instead of listening to sound doctrine what do they do they just bring about people that tell them whatever they want to hear because they're not they're not interested in the truth they just want somebody to tell them that everything they believe is correct and everything that they do is wonderful 
Christians around the world pray the Lord's Prayer all the time, which begins like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hold on, hold on a second. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Christians are saying, God, we want your will to be done on earth. You know, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But these same Christians are no different than the ones that Jesus spoke of. These People, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me because they're saying they want God's will to be done. But in actuality, you see that they're gathering around themselves a many number of teachers who say whatever their itching ears want to hear. And what do their ear itching ears want to hear? They want to hear everything that you believe is the will of God. You, Everything you believe is true. You know everything. Everything that you believe, everything that you do is in line with God. That's God's will because you want it. That's God's will. Instead of saying like, hey, hold on. God is the standard. And let's see if your desires, the desires of your heart are lining up with what God's will is. No, instead they're saying, oh, well, this is your desire. Well, yeah, obviously that's what God wants for you. And it's like, do you not see that you're being exploited, that they are exploiting you in their greed? Crack your Bible over to 2 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing in swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways, and they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. They're playing on your ego, your pride, the desires of your flesh. And this is why not only do Christians need to be aware of what's going on and how these false teachers who have crept into the church, these controlled opposition, how they interact with believers. But we also have to search ourselves to say, why am I so apt to, f to follow the prophecies of obvious known false teachers like a Mark Taylor? Election, all the fake news, the pundits, the polls were all uh, wrong as we found out. Uh, it was just the exact opposite of what they were saying. So the same thing is going to happen here. There will be no blue wave. Uh, a lot of people are talking about a red wave, but it's actually going to be a red tsunami uh, is what the Lord is showing me. Because it's Oh, a red tsunami. Like he... Everything he prophesies, like it's such a joke. He's had so many false prophecies, and yet time and time and time again, he is featured on so many Christian channels. He's always given out prophecies, bringing down curses on people to the third and fourth generation. Let me tell you something. Every Christian, every pastor out there that voted for Joe Biden last night, you have bought a curse upon yourself and your family your children and your children's children down to the third and fourth generation, and you need to repent. I don't care if you are pro-life. You cannot call yourself a Christian and call yourself a, a Republican or, or vote for Biden. You know what I mean? Or call yourself a Democrat. I mean, or, or whatever it is. You call yourself a Democrat and a Christian, it doesn't matter. If you voted for the dark side, that's what you did. You are implementing the dark agenda, Satan's agenda, the kingdom of darkness. You are not supporting the kingdom of God. And if you cannot see that, you have, if you do not repent, judgment will fall upon you, I believe, and your family and your children's children down to the third and fourth generation. And it's like, how do you still have a following when Deuteronomy 18 is clear that false prophecy, one false prophecy, you're done. It's Christians. We have to search ourselves and say, what is going on in my life? What's going on in my heart? What's going on in my spirit where I am allowing myself to be swindled by false teachers who just tell me what I want to hear. Why do I want to hear these things instead of hearing the, the word of the Lord? Wouldn't I rather hear the truth? 
Or do I just want to hear a lie that makes me feel comfortable that's going to lead to destruction? This is why we have to search ourselves. This is why we have to be in line with the Holy Spirit. Every day I die to myself. I crucify myself. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Because Satan knows the desires of your flesh. He plays on your fleshly weaknesses, but you don't have an excuse because not only are you being transformed by the Holy Spirit, but you have his word. You have direct access to him. You can call on his name and he'll answer you at any time. Christians, it starts with us. We cannot afford to give any more time to false teachers. We cannot give a platform to false prophets. And it starts with us. What can we do about it? It starts with us. Number one, anybody who has falsely prophesied the ending or the beginning or certain things would happen on this date, that date, whatever date, if it didn't come to pass in that specific way, the day after the election, election night, uh, the first week of November, you know, whatever they have prophesied, if it didn't already come to pass in the exact way that they said that it would happen, you cut them off. You unsubscribe because we cannot allow them to continue to gain legitimacy through our subscription, through us watching their videos, through listening to their sermons, to liking their social media posts. We cannot continue to rubber stamp an approval on these false teachers because it's leading people astray. Real people's souls, their eternal souls are on the line. And I don't know who you've listened to, but the Holy Spirit is bringing people up to your remembrance, videos that you've watched, sermons that you've watched, interviews, social media posts. And even though we are weeks past the election, which has given people time to delete videos, to hide videos, to change subscriptions, uh, to, to change uh, thumbnails, to change titles on videos, you know, you know what you've seen. You've known what you've listened to. You've heard the prophecies. You've seen the titles of videos, the prophecy, what God told me about the election. You've seen this from so many pastors and prophets and apostles, always self-styled. Um, so you know what you've heard. So regardless of whether or not you can go back and find the evidence, you know what you've heard. And the Holy Spirit is bringing it up to your remembrance. So it is time that you take a stand and you say, I'm not standing for false teachers. I'm not going to give legitimacy to these false prophets. And I'm going to cut ties with these people. I'm no longer going to listen to these people who prophesy falsely in the name of the Lord. As an example of a false prophets who are exploiting Christians in their greed, I'm going to talk about somebody who many of you have brought to my attention as somebody who is making all sorts of prophecies about the election here in 2020. And he goes by the name Brother Marcus Rogers. And the reason that I'm going to talk about him is because you all have brought him to my attention. So on November 7th, 2020, he put out a video on YouTube titled Brother Marcus, a false prophet because Biden won, question mark. If you have not been making definitive statements, you wouldn't even need to put out a video title like, am I a false prophet? Like, you wouldn't even have to address that because you already know that you're not making prophecies. You're not putting uh, words out there that are insinuating or giving people the idea that what you are claiming is from the mouth of God. And he has put out videos, what God showed me about the election, what God prophesied about the election. He's already put out videos of that nature with those kind of titles. And then he's going to say like, oh, well, you know, even though Biden won, does that make me a false prophet? Yes, it makes you a false prophet because if you say on election night, we're going to see this happen and election night came and went and they didn't even finish counting the votes. Well, everybody who prophesied anything about election night was wrong because we didn't even have a final count, uh, you know, on election night. It wasn't even finished on election night. So if you already are having to put out a video like, 
let me address the fact that y'all think that I'm a false prophet now. It's because you already know that you put out information, you put out videos, you put out social media posts insinuating or just flat out saying God told me or God showed me this. And then he goes on and has the audacity to say, you know, um, you know, if he wins, I'm going to apologize. I'm standing on, you know, what I felt. You know, if I if I'm wrong about it and Biden walks in the office in January, I'm just going to take a break and I'm going to go talk to God about it. And say, all right, Lord, I missed it. You know, I, I missed it somewhere. Um, maybe I just wanted a season, another four years of grace so bad. And I didn't want this LGBTQ persecution and stuff to, you know, come earlier. And that could very well be so. But, um, you know, it is what it is. Hold on. There is no apology. In Deuteronomy 18 does not have like an addendum over there that says, you know, like, okay, actually the false prophets can live as long as they're really sorry and they apologize. No, <laughs> you're done. Like, you're just, you're done. And he goes on to say, you know, I'm going to apologize, but hold on. Uh, nobody can find a video. Convenient that this came out, you know, days, four days after the election. Um, Nobody can find a video of me saying God said this to me. And including me, you know, our word ends up being wrong. And I want to do clear, clear one thing up. I don't think anybody can find a video or a post where I said God told me that Trump was going to win. I said God showed me certain things and gave me certain revelations, which that's why I believe that Trump was going to win. And that's why I still believe he's going to win now. But I never said like God told me like he was talking to me. That Trump was going to win. But I did say, yes, Trump's going to win two terms. I said all of that kind of stuff. And that was based off the things that God showed me. Again, you didn't put this out on election day. So you had time to go in and remove or change whatever you want. I'm not saying that he did. I'm just saying that he had the time to do so because I'm not familiar with his entire catalog of videos. But it's like... Why would you make that kind of statement when I myself have seen videos titled what, what God showed me about the election? Trying to play the semantics game. Do not allow it, Christians. Do not allow false prophets to play a semantics game where they say, you know, even though I titled things, you know, what God showed me about the election or, you know, the word of God or, you know, all of us have been prophesying these things. No, 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 no. It's the same thing. God told me, God showed me, God gave me a vision, God gave me a dream, God impressed upon me, God gave me a word of knowledge, God sent someone to tell me, any of it, it's the same thing. You are saying that it came from God himself, this information came from God himself. So don't try to twist it and try to church it up and try to weasel your way out of it and be like, well, I didn't actually say God said, I said God showed. It's the same thing. I did say, yes, Trump's going to win two terms. I said all of that kind of stuff. And that was based off the things that God showed me. It is the same thing. And anybody who is not a false prophet or weasel wouldn't even be making these kind of arguments. Nobody who has any sort of integrity, anybody who's actually following the word of the Lord would never even make such a ridiculous, just, just an absolute absurd statement. Well, you know, I didn't say, I said God showed. That's talking out of two sides of your mouth. Christians do not put up with this. Do not put up with this. And then he goes on to say that, you know, so many brothers and sisters, we're all seeing the same thing. I'll say right now is my perspective has not changed. It, because it was so many men and women of God, black, white, Latino, who felt the same thing. And so I feel like I'm standing in good, uh, good company, you know, and if all of them, including me, you know, our word ends up being wrong. And I want to do clear, clear one thing up. I don't think anybody can find a video or a post where I said, God told me that Trump was going to win. I said, God showed me. Oh my gosh. Crack your Bible over to 1 Kings chapter 22. We're going to talk about my favorite minor prophet of the Bible, Mihayu, also known as Micaiah in the English. But crack your Bible over to 1 Kings chapter 22 to see if, well, everybody else is prophesying these things is an acceptable defense in the Bible. Starting at verse 1. For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel had said to his officials, 
Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth, or Ramoth Gilead? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, Shall I go to the war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not another prophet of the Lord here we can inquire of? The king of Israel, Ahab, answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. His name is Miayu, son of Imla. The king should not say that, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Miahu, son of Imla, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria, with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Kenah, had made iron horns, and he declared, this is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who had gone to summon Miayu said to him, Look, as one man, the other prophets are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Miayu said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. This is where Mi'ai, who gets real sarcastic, attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Mi'ai, who answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? Micaiah continued, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all of the host of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Kenav, went up and slapped Miayu in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Miayu replied, you will find out on the day you go to hide in an inner room. The king of Israel then ordered, take Miayu and send him back to Amon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, this is what the king says, put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Miaihu declared, if you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. And then we go on to see in the rest of 1 Kings chapter 22, King Ahab is killed at Ramoth Gilead, just as Miaihu said. He would not be victorious. He would not push back the Arameans with horns. No, the people would be scattered and Ahab died, just as Mihaihu prophesied. It didn't matter that 400 other prophets were all prophesying this lie that was going out, just saying whatever, you know, King Ahab wanted to hear. Oh, you know, I don't want to hear Mihaihu. I don't want to hear what he has to say because he never says anything good about me. Again, people just want to hear 
whatever, you know, their desires are, that's what's going to happen. And that's the will of the Lord. That is what they want to hear. So they bring about many false teachers and false prophets who say what they want to hear. And this is what happens. Disaster happens. This is why Marcus Rogers excuse that all of these people, oh, other people, Latino brother, whatever, like irrelevant. It is irrelevant. It does not justify you making a false prophecy and you know you made a false prophecy otherwise you wouldn't have needed to make this video in the first place trying to defend yourself against claims that now you're a false prophet because you know and everybody else that listens to your channel knows that you made these bold prophecies about the election if it's just me like that's me and my feelings like i just believe so strong that we're gonna have four more years of just grace and four more years to you know wake people up and get revival before King Saul comes, which I've talked about the King Saul many times before, then that's what it's going to be. God is going to um, show me that I missed it. I'm going to have to go hit the prayer closet. I'm going to have to admit that. And then he goes on to say, you know, uh, you know, if he, if Biden wins or whatever, you know, he's just going to take a break and talk to God and just see where it went wrong. And, you know, maybe it was just he had such a strong desire for his own will. He just he just wanted to believe so bad that he prophesied these things. I'm standing on, you know, what I felt. And uh, if, I, if I'm wrong about it and Biden walks in the office in January, I'm just going to take a break and I'm going to go talk to God about it and say, all right, Lord, I missed it. You know, I, I missed it somewhere. Um, maybe I just wanted a season, another four years of grace so bad. And I didn't want this LGBTQ persecution and stuff to, you know, come earlier. And that could very well be so, but, um, you know, it is what it is. That is unacceptable. Unacceptable. You don't get to say, oh, sorry, you guys. You know, I just, I just was hoping so bad that my team would win that, you know, I made all of these bold prophecies um, and they didn't come to pass, but you, you guys just got to give me grace and you got to forgive me. And I'm just, I'm just going to spend time with God and just spend time in prayer, see where I won't, went wrong. Uh, you know where you went wrong when you decided to prophesy the delusions of your own mind instead of listening to the word of the Lord, regardless of whether or not it was going to be favorable to your audience or not. Christians, we cannot allow these false prophets to have a platform. You cannot continue to support these people and give an ear to these people and to spread all of their false prophecies to one another because it makes people feel comfortable. It makes people feel justified in acting or believing in the things that they do. All of these are distractions, taking your eyes off Jesus and preventing people from hearing the message of the gospel. Christians, our job is not to build up earthly kingdoms through politics. It's to build up Jesus's kingdom. It is to make way for the King of Kings who is coming on a cloud where we will meet him in the air and be changed in an instant. We are here awaiting the King of Kings. And we want others to know about the grace and the love and redemption that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what we want to share with other people. We're not here to share any other message, but the message of Jesus. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. Remember, here's your homework. Unsubscribe from all of these false teachers. We don't have time. And I'm tired of you being taken out by a spirit of fear, by false prophets, false teachers, controlled opposition, working for Satan, leading you astray, and simultaneously ushering in the spirit of fear so that they can control you and throw you off course. We got to keep the faith, fam. So please like, subscribe, and share this video with somebody who needs to hear it, and I will talk to you later. Bye!